A question I've been getting a lot recently is in regards to the workflow of working with notch blocks inside of Touch Designer. You know, one of the tricky things when you get started is finding out how to make this workflow more iterative, more faster, and easier to respond to client demands or even the needs of a project when you're on the job site. So in this example, we're gonna look at this kind of workflow. What I'm gonna use as the basis of this are the interactive starter pack from Notch, which is a really great free pack you can download at notch.one forward slash interactive. And you can see from the videos that there is a lot of really amazing high-end content ready to go inside of this pack, and I have it downloaded here. We can see there's 14 different ones. If you saw our blog post recently, we used neon balls. And in this one, I'm gonna use this 2A-Mountain which is actually a really cool interactive piece that shows off different mountains, where they are. It's got a cool data viz vibe to it. All this geometry is being generated. And you can kind of select through the different mountains based on their peak range. Now, one of the tough things, like I said, is this workflow that you might be used to, which is that you've gone really far in a notch project. You export it as a media block and you bring it into touch designer or similar. And then you find out, oh man, I want to edit something. I want to change the color of something or turn the particles on or off. And you realize this is a parameter that you didn't expose, so you don't have access to it inside a touch designer. And this leaves you to basically go back to Notch, make your edit, re-export the whole thing, go back into touch designer, reload it, and you know hope this doesn't take more than a minute or two. Now, one of the cool things about having a Builder Pro license for Notch is that you can access something called remote live editing of nodes. Now, the cool thing is that this also extends to not just you know, one Notch machine controlling another Notch machine, but this can also be one Notch machine controlling a Notch block embedded into a system like Touch Designer. Now, this can work on this same machine, which is what I'm gonna show you today, but it can also extend to working on different machines. So if you have a laptop that's kind of your edit station and then you have your main production computer that's you know, a big desktop that maybe doesn't have a monitor plugged into it, this can be a really great way to work on those workflows. So I have this example here and one of the great things about this pack of interactive starters is the array functionality built into it by default. You know, exposable arrays are something that I'm talking about a lot lately because it allows us to scale the content between touch designer and notch really easily. And all of these examples come built in using arrays by default. So in this example, if I come down to the bottom left area, I'll see the default arrays that have been added for mouse pointer, which is how we create this interaction here, the Windows Touch, TUIO, Hokuyo, all these good things. And I'm gonna go ahead and first drop my exposable array into this project. I highly recommend, especially if you're gonna be using this remote editing feature of Notch, set up all of your inputs and outputs accordingly before you start doing this remote editing. A lot of the media servers that are gonna be hosting Notch blocks are not gonna really like it when you start changing inputs and outputs on a Notch block in real time. You know, a lot of them could crash or experience some kind of instabilities. So setting your inputs and outputs are very important because then after that, as you'll see, we can kind of go through anything on the network and start playing with it. But if you start playing with inputs and outputs, you're probably gonna be in for a bad time. So I'm gonna have this exposable array. I can see all the other arrays and I can just match their wiring to be honest. So I can take my exposable array, plug it into the bottom left input of the array copy. I can see that all of the arrays have a source from the camera that just gives them a generic position. So I'll go to my camera up here, grab the output, and assign it to the top input of my exposable array. Finally, the only thing I have to do on my exposable array, well, two things actually, is in this case, because this is really a kind of single mouse click environment, I'm only gonna need to have one set of transforms. I don't need to have 10 data points coming in from Touch Designer. And then I have to finally expose my transform data so that inside a touch designer, I can create a chop with all that transform details and then have those exposed uh, back into Notch. Now, one thing I'm gonna notice while I'm going through this process, uh, let me go ahead and expose this property, is that if I look at these other arrays that I have here, all of them have a Z position of four. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually on my exposable array, match that Z positions to make sure that 
you know, any transform data I'm sending is going to be working correctly. Otherwise, inside of touch, I could also go ahead and just offset my Z position by four on the data point. But it's better if you match that inside of the project. So once I have that set up, I'm basically ready to export this notch block. And I'm just gonna save this onto my desktop. And then in Touch Designer, I'm gonna go ahead and load this up. Now, once this is loaded, it's important to set the resolution on it because by default, it's going to be 1280 by 720. Now, if I hop back into the Notch project, either I can look in the bottom right here and I can see project resolution, 3840 by 1152, or I can hop into the project settings, rendering, and in here I can see my output width and height. So I'm gonna match that in Touch Designer, but since I'm on my laptop, I'm also just gonna down res it a little bit. So I'll do 3840, divided by four, which will give me one quarter of the resolution, and 1152 divided by four. You can see once I have that resolution set, now I can see all the text, aspect ratio looks correct, and we're ready to start feeding in some data. So I'll go ahead in this case and make a constant chop, just because we're essentially gonna be simulating those touch points on the screen, and we don't really need to have you know, noise or anything else like that. We can just use a constant chop. So I'm gonna go and make a TX, TY, TZ channels. And then if you haven't used exposable arrays yet, I'd highly recommend checking out our blog or other YouTube videos about them because we do need to feed in the full set of transforms. So position, rotations, and scale values for every single data point that we're gonna feed in. So even if we end up zeroing them out, we still have to feed them in. Oops, that should be RZ, then SX for scale, SY, and SZ. And I always recommend setting your scales to be one because scaling something to a factor of zero is basically gonna make it disappear. And with that, I'm ready to go ahead and plug this constant into my transform data chop parameter. And then what I can do is start moving the TY around to see if this is actually working. And we can see as I move my TY, I'm getting the slider moving up and down. And as I'm moving my TX, I'm getting that little previs ball showing my interaction with the general scene moving around as well. So everything's working really great right now. Now this is where we can go ahead and set up our kind of live network editing. Because normally, like I said, if we're in this process and the client said, hey, can you move this text over to the right a little bit? Well, lo and behold, you'd have to come back to Notch, find the text, move it, re-export the Notch block, and that is just not a jolly old good time. Now in this case, what we can do is go to Devices and Network Connection. And in this connection IP address is where you wanna type in the address of the machine that has the Notch block running on it. If you're working on the same machine like I am right now, you can hit localhost, or you can put in the IP address of that machine, whether it's a 192 address or anything like that. You hit connect, and it's gonna go ahead and search the network for any embedded notch blocks or notch applications running, and it'll list all the connections here. So we can see right now I only have one other instance of notch running, which is, you can see here, mountain.dfxdll. I'll go ahead and hit okay. And just like that, we'll see connected in the bottom, and I am ready to go. So now one of the really cool things is how responsive this is and how easy it is to manipulate. So let's say, for example, I had that exact same request. Let's say I wanna move the font over to the right and I really quickly wanna see this, the client's behind my shoulder, they're asking me for all kinds of stuff. I can go over and actually, let's make this screen a little bit smaller. I can go over to the renderer here. I have the mountain name and you can see I, as I'm changing this property inside of Notch, it's actually moving that same property inside of my Notch block that's still running in real time. So, you know, they could even be messing with it still. They could be here, you know, let me actually maybe put an LFO to demonstrate. 
I'll make a very slow LFO. Let's make it 0 0.01. And I'm going to assign it to my TY. So we can see this is kind of changing our Y position of the slider dynamically. So even if they were still messing with the actual project, I could be inside of Notch, kind of live tweaking stuff, you know, oh, what do you think about the text at the bottom? I could go find, for example, let's see what we else we got here. We can find the shape 3Ds here, turn things on and off. You know, maybe we get rid of the line here. Any of the things inside of this network are completely available for you to iterate with quickly. Now, once you get into this final state of wanting to actually commit your changes, it's really important to know that this live editing is more of a puppeteering. So it doesn't actually save any of the changes you've made into the notch block that's running, you know, whether it's local or on a different computer. These are kind of live controls that you're commanding. So once you're in that final state and you're, you say, yes, I want to commit all these changes, then you would actually go back to your notch application, go to project, compile block for media server, you know, recompile that notch block. If it's on the same computer, then you want to go into touch designer, deactivate it and reactivate it. If it's on a different computer, you know, maybe transfer it with a USB key or something, because then you'll have all those changes saved and ready to go inside your media server. So I hope that helps and that makes your workflow with notch and touch designer a lot better in your professional practice. Hey folks, thanks for watching. If you're serious about learning touch designer and getting into our interactive and immersive industry, I highly recommend you check out the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can click the link in the description to learn more about that. And if you like this video, hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and click on the little bell icon for more awesome free content.